Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Flepson. I'm the Reading Program Specialist for Reading Within Reach, which, su which supports the Global Reading Network. Um, thank you for joining us today. I know for some of you it's early morning and we have people all the way uh, in the evening their time. We appreciate that you took time out of your day or night to join us for what is the last webinar for Reading Within Reach. Um, and we're very happy to be presenting the Classroom Observation Toolkit, which a team at REACH, as well as um, a lot of people from the Global Reading Network have contributed to. Um, this webinar um, was supported by USAID, which as many of you know, has supported REACH for the past five years. And REACH in turn supports the Global Reading Network community of practice. And um, we recently had an event to um, showcase and to share and to talk about the work that the Global Reading Network has done. And if you uh, were not able to attend that event, um, some information was sent out in our last newsletter about some of the resources that have recently been released and the ones that are coming this and next week that you can look forward to. Um, well, REACH is ending at the end of November. All of those resources are going to be migrated over to USA's Education Links website. If you're not familiar with it, the URL is in this slide, and we hope you will check all of those out soon. I'd like to introduce to you the authors uh, of the Classroom Observation Toolkit and who will be presenting it today. Uh, we have our lead author, Dr. Ashley Hertz. She is an education practitioner and technical specialist with more than 20 years of experience working on basic education quality improvement, mostly in limited resource contexts. In addition to her early career as a primary and middle school language arts teacher, she's held various technical advisory and research roles supporting early grade literacy and girls education initiatives for a variety of donors, governments, agencies, and schools. Um, globally, including Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and South Asia. Her area of specialization and passion is improving teacher quality and learning through school-based continuous teacher professional development in the context of literacy improvement initiatives. Um, and Ashley is based in Bangkok, Thailand. As you can see, it's quite late there. So we thank <laughs> Ashley for staying up to join us to share um, all of the interesting work that has gone into this toolkit. Ashley. <laughs> um, we're joined also by um, Emily Kachikova. Emily is a researcher and project manager specializing in monitoring, evaluation, and assessment. Um, from 2018 to two, uh, 2011, excuse me, to 2018, Emily supported and managed numerous projects and studies while working at RTI International, where she coordinated the development and implementation of in individual and group administered reading and math assessments including school-based research and various qualitative research. Since 2018, Emily has worked as an independent consultant for a range of organizations and initiatives. This has included working with REACH to develop USAID's forthcoming literacy landscape assessment, um, supporting one of DFID's Girls Education Challenge pro uh, projects, and evaluating, USA evaluating USAID's inclusive education programming. Um, Emily holds degrees in English literature and macro social work and is currently based in Durham, North Carolina. Um, so many of you ha have probably seen me before on the webinars. Um, as I mentioned earlier when we started, I'm Allison Flepson. I work as the reading program specialist for REACH. Um, I've supported a variety of early grade reading initiatives and assessment work, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. And for the past three years, I've been working with REACH to develop um, the variety of resources and professional development opportunities. And it's been really um, a pleasure to work with this community of practice and the many people who have um, contributed to this resource. So without further ado, we'll, we'll start to dive into this webinar because we have a lot to share in a relatively short period of time. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Ashley who will talk about the purpose and the format of today's event. Thank you, Allison, um, for the introduction and for everyone for joining us today. Um, very happy to be here to, to launch this toolkit and to share um, some of the highlights of the toolkit. Um, it's been a, it's been a, um, 
over a year long process getting this together. So um, we're all very thrilled to, to share this with you today. Um, for the next few moments, I'm going to briefly share the purpose of the webinar and then hear from you a bit about what you want, hope you to learn from this short course that we're calling it. Um, and then I'll share the format of the webinar and what we plan to cover. So to begin, and I'm going to take my video off for right now. We'll see you again soon, but I'm going to just stop it for now. Um, so to begin, the, the overall purpose of this webinar is to introduce you as the participants to the structure and content of the Classroom Observation Toolkit and provide you with some practical guidance to consider when developing and using classroom, ob classroom observation instruments for different purposes. But before we start diving into um, the content, I'd like to start, take a moment to start with, to hear from you about what classroom observation, what experiences you have, or what you know about classroom observation and what you'd like to learn through this webinar. So to help do this, I'd like to use what we call a KWL chart. Many of you might be familiar with this exercise. Um, to start, if you have a piece of paper nearby, uh, take a moment to draw three large boxes similar to the slide you see with each box next to each other with an, enough space to write just a few sentences in each or just a few words. Label the first box with a K, the second with a W, and the third with an L. And in this activity right now, we're gonna focus on the first two boxes. If you don't have a piece of paper, uh, we'll I'll guide you through. This is a very simple activity. So for the K box, I'd like you to think about what it is you already know about classroom observation or the toolkit, either one. Perhaps you can't list everything here, but just to jot down a few bullet points of key ideas of things you know and feel really good about. I'll give you a, a minute or so to do so. Okay, I'm seeing a couple of um, classroom observation is hard to do well. It focuses on coaching. It can be used for different purposes. I have not the, um, well, there's a lot of comments. It's quite hard to follow all of them, but great. These are great answers. Some people have observed a lot of classes, methods, and tools. Someone knows about low inference items. It's great to see. Uh, Someone's had an experience with, uh, Emily Chess has had experience with gender-sensitive gender classroom observation. Great, lots of great answers coming up. Lots of varied experiences. Someone is asking, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to stop right there. Those are all very great and giving me a little bit of an idea of uh, who else here and what kind of um, ex things you know and some things that you're looking for. Um, we are going to move to the next slide. We're going to, uh, if you can hold that for now, we're going to come back to this chart a little bit later. So now that you've shared and what you hope to learn today about classroom observation, I would like to share what we planned for today and hope that you'll be able to do by the end of the webinar. So by the end of this webinar, we hope you as the participants will be able to explain classroom observation, its different purposes and use, to be able to identify features to consider when selecting instruments, to reflect on and share experiences, and to be able to apply guidance to improve efforts on instrument development and adaptation, uh, preparation of observers on instrument use, instrument administration, dissemination and use of results, and a few other planning considerations that we'll discuss. We hope this content will at least touch on some of the areas you hope to learn today. From what I could see from um, the chats that there are a lot of people with varied experiences in different of these phase, different phases of these that we're gonna be talking about today. This is a slide that should have come up earlier and sorry for that. If you have questions or comments throughout the webinar, please do feel free to share. We will provide time at, each, at the end of each section for you to ask questions, but feel free to share at different points. Someone will be monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation. If you submit your comments to all panelists and attendees, which many of you have been 
doing in the Zoom chat box, the panelists and others will be able to see and respond. Okay, now we're going to just take you on a, a little, a couple more warm up activities to um, get you reflecting a bit more about those experiences that you just mentioned. Um, we're going to take a little poll here. If Ashley, you can go to the next slide. Um, and Gabrielle, who's providing our tech support, um, is going to bring up a poll here. And we'd like to ask, um, have, you, have you ever been observed while teaching a lesson? If you have been observed, we hope it was a positive and useful experience to you, but just trying to get you back in those shoes of what it felt like to be observed. And you can hopefully see the poll questions pop up and select yes or no, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, number two, have you ever observed a teacher and documented what you observed using a classroom observation tool? And the last question, have you ever helped develop or implement a classroom observation instrument for early grade reading? Looks like many of you have done that. If you were curious now that we have, uh, looks like upwards of 100 people out there. What percentage of you have ever helped to develop or implement a tool before? So once you've um, noted your responses, you can hit submit and then we'll see the results here. Oh, great. Well, it looks like quite a few people have been observed themselves while teaching a lesson, almost 70%. That's great. So you've been in that position of, of having the eyes on you. And I think that's an important perspective to have when we're developing and planning for classroom observation exercises. Um, 85% of you have been the observer and also a very useful role to have been in if you are going to be planning and, and uh, developing tools. And 70% have ever helped and developed a tool. So we hope for those of you who, who have, you'll share some of your experiences, continue throughout the webinar. And for those who haven't developed anything yet, um, we imagine maybe you, you will. And we hope that a lot of the guidance uh, and sharing of experiences will be useful for everyone as we work as a community to improve what we're doing. So Ashley, we can, I think, move to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna hand the presentation now over to Emily, who's gonna provide you with an introduction to the toolkit and a bit about the background and methodology for development. All right, good morning, everyone. So judging from the participation in this webinar, as Allison said, we have over 100 of you out there now, um, as well as the interest shown about classroom observation at other USAID and REACH events, it seems fair to say that this is gaining more and more attention across stakeholders. Or perhaps it's more accurate to say that classroom observation is finally getting the open and candid attention that it deserves. Nearly everyone in early grade reading programming engages in some form of classroom observation. And while we talk about it within our organizations and individual project teams, in the past, we've tended to shy away from discussing it as a community of practice. The reason for this, at least in part, may be that classroom observation can be a complex and varied undertaking that often feels to practitioners like we are kind of winging it a bit. The reality is that classroom observation can serve a variety of different purposes, and each purpose needs an appropriate instrument and careful attention to how the instrument is used. This toolkit was born out of a realization on USAID's part that its mission personnel, as well as reading program implementers, evaluators, and government counterparts would benefit from guidance on how to develop and use classroom observation instruments for these different purposes. So the toolkit explains classroom observation and, and these different purposes. It describes features to consider when selecting and adapting instruments. It shares real life early grade reading program practices and experiences sent to us by several of you. It provides guidance on issues to consider. And last but not least, it provides templates of classroom observation instruments that can be adapted for use. We do want to note that while we hope and believe that the toolkit will be a useful resource for you all, it is not a detailed guide on how to write specific instrument items or content. 
those of you who are implementers or evaluators will still need to consult specialists in various domains when you design and plan for classroom observation. The toolkit does provide a list of all the things to consider, which can inform those conversations, but much deeper dives are possible and would be needed on some issues. So um, just to speak a moment about the methodology, um, we first conducted an extensive literature review, which revealed many factors to consider when designing tools. We then designed a survey to learn from early grade reading program implementers about how they use classroom observation. The survey included questions related to the purpose of classroom observation in the program, the instrument development process, instrument administration in classrooms, how data are used, and the process of training classroom observers to use the tools. We were very grateful to have received many responses to the survey, as you can see on the slide. We also received and reviewed several classroom observation tools to get a sense of details, such as design and organization, what elements of teaching and learning were being observed, how the tool guided observers through the process, and how feedback was provided uh, in the case of, of coaching and mentoring tools. Some of you online were among those who responded to the survey and shared tools with us, so thank you once again. So what did we learn from this survey? The responses to the survey really served to inform the shape and content of the toolkit. Although we generally knew that classroom observation was commonly done, um, we learned that purposes, processes, tools, and data use vary significantly across users. We also learned that the quality of the instruments varies quite a bit and that overall guidance is needed for making decisions about the instrument content and format in light of factors such as purpose, the capacity of those who will ultimately use the instruments and the context for their use. We learned that instrument reliability and validity needs more intention and that better planning and observer training are key factors throughout. We're sharing all this so that as we go through the specific content of the toolkit today, you'll know what informed our decisions about what to discuss and cover in this resource. Also, we encourage you to keep these things in mind during the webinar and reflect on how these issues might pertain to your own work or programs. We will be discuss discussing all of these issues in more detail this morning. All right, let's dive into the actual toolkit. Everyone should have received the toolkit to download. So if you haven't already, go ahead and open up the file and scroll on down to the table of content, contents, which is always a good place to start. And we'll give you a couple of minutes now to familiarize yourself with the main sections of the toolkit. As you skim the headings, Note the key differences in content between each main section. You might jot down or highlight in your copy the sections that jump out to you as particularly interesting or relevant to your own experience. And I see that um, if you look in the chat box, if anyone doesn't have the toolkit or didn't get it in an email, um, there's a link to uh, Google Drive um, file where you can open the toolkit. So just, just look for that link in your chat box. And I'll just give everyone a minute to, to navigate over there and check out our table of contents. Um, as you'll have noticed, the two biggest sections of the toolkit are understanding classroom observation and early grade reading program experiences and guidance. The first section defines classroom observation and goes into detail about its importance, the different purposes I referenced earlier, and key features of content and structure. Then we highlight the real program experiences so many of you shared with us. We highlight examples from practice and we provide guidance on these various categories listed here. 
Then we close the toolkit with a summary of the key takeaways and a look to the future of classroom observation. And lastly, after a bibliography, we have a series of annexes that provide several instrument templates along with important considerations for each. One feature of the toolkit that came from the survey responses and resources shared with us um, is the several examples from practice boxes that you will find throughout the program experiences and guidance section. For example, here is one that describes how social impact is using two different observation instruments as part of their impact evaluation of the Ghana Partnership for Education learning activity. So this describes how one instrument is used to assess teachers use of program specific reading strategies and the other is a standardized instrument used for measuring time on task. They serve different purposes, and so they have different features, including item construction and response formats. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Ashley, who will present on classroom observation in the context of early grade reading initiatives. Great, thank you, Emily. So as Emily discussed, the first section of the toolkit is uh, called Understanding Classroom Observation. This section provides a general introduction to classroom observations, the different purposes in which it, you, it is used or can be used, and defines the key terms and concepts related to instrument content, content and structure. The content of this section is, is informed by a desk review of current literature on classroom observation and instrument development and use more broadly. This section provides the key terms and the overarching framework that basically guided our tool develop, our survey development and our analysis of the uh, experiences that others shared with us through surveys and the dev development of the guidance we end up providing. So in this toolkit, we define classroom observation as the process of an individual observing a teacher facilitating a lesson either in the classroom or another type of formal or learn informal, non-formal learning environment. However, other terms are often used to describe this process. You may have heard teacher observation or lesson observation or literacy walkthrough or classroom walkthrough. In the toolkit, we use the term classroom observation to kind of refer to all of those types. And we emphasize in the toolkit that the overall goal of any classroom observation is to improve the quality of teaching and learning in the classroom while the purpose of conducting a classroom observation and the use of the information can vary. So in the toolkit, we unpack a bit uh, several of the different purposes in which classroom observations can be used. For example, observations can be used to identify teacher professional de development needs prior to program design. They might be used to support individual teacher growth, uh, through coaching. I noticed that some of you mentioned that classroom observation was used for coaching. Um, observations can also be used to help a program monitor implementation. Observations can be used ev to evaluate the uh, impact of professional development on uh, teacher behaviors and use of uh, specific strategies. Sometimes observations are used to, uh, through research to generate new knowledge about teaching learning processes. For example, you might be interested in just exploring student teacher, uh, student teacher interactions and you are focusing on classroom observations to capture those interactions. Uh, classroom observation can also be used to uh, measure the quality of teaching at a system level where you might collect data from a lot of teachers in different contexts to compare. Um, and it can also be used in, to evaluate teacher performance. Um, this at, like a performance review for their employment that will help make decisions about promotions and salaries. Uh, in an observation, classroom observation instruments or tools to, are used to record what the observer sees in terms of teacher behavior, student behavior, resource use, and or the classroom environment itself. Instruments help focus the observation and gather information that can be used to help improve teacher practices and ultimately student learning outcomes. When we reviewed the early grade reading program surveys uh, from all of you, some of you, we found that programs describe several purposes for using classroom observation in a single instrument. 
The most common purposes reported was providing support, support and feedback to teachers, mostly through coaching. Uh, that's individual support, uh, monitoring implementation fidelity, or monitoring implementation of some sort, and evaluating the impact of professional development on teacher behavior, meaning that they were using them in uh, using observations in evaluations. Other less common purposes that were reported in our survey, but equally important are identifying teacher professional development needs prior to the design of a project um, or initiative and generating new knowledge about teaching and learning processes through research. Our surveys also showed a lot of variation and review of the instruments uh, showed a lot of variation between instruments in terms of type and quality across programs and purposes. Some used the instru same instrument for different purposes. Some programs used a distinct instrument for each purpose, resulting in three or four tools within one program. As part of the guidance on toolkit, we stress that when designing an intervention, it's important to identify the purpose of observation as an initial step, as this will inform the other decisions about what type of instrument you will need. This is really the very first step, is making sure that you understand the purposes, and not many of us are aware of how how these different purposes impact the type of instrument that you will be using. Um, programs also need to consider how the program will use the information. For example, will the information that is collected be shared only with individual teachers as feedback to support their individual support? That would be in the case of a coach where you're just, you're, you're observing a teacher and you're giving feedback and that, that information is between you and uh, the, you as a coach and the teacher. Or will it be shared publicly to inform larger decision making about a program or an initiative? These are all decisions that need to be made prior to any design of an instrument. When selecting or developing an instrument, there's no one size fits all. Instruments will vary depending on the context, the observation purpose, and the information needs of the program. But sorry, the context, the purpose and information needs of the program and the capacity of the observer. These three main factors directly influence the type of features and contents that will need to be considered when you're selecting or maybe you're developing your own instrument. For this, we stress the importance of understanding the context, purpose and observer capacity prior to any instrument development process. In the section on understanding classroom observation, and if you're looking through the toolkit right now, that would be between pages eight through 12, we define the following key terms that must be considered. Validity, reliability, item and response formats, instrument focus, instructional categories and observable behaviors, feasibility and usability. So this section we really just basically define so that you have a good understanding of what these terms are before you go into the uh, second sections on uh, uh, early grade reading program experiences. So for the next few slides, I will go through each of these to define these terms and share a bit of what we learned from each from the surveys on each of these. If you would like more description or follow along, you can look through pages nine through 13 or eight through 12. So instrument validity and re reliability. These terms are important terms that need to be considered when developing a high quality observation instrument. These concepts are, these concepts are not unique to classroom observation instruments and are important to consider when developing or adapting any type of data collection instrument that will be used to collect data that can be compared. So if you're comparing um, data across teachers, schools, districts, countries, um, it is very important that you have um, you, have, you consider both of these. In the context of EGR programs or early grade reading programs, the survey results revealed a, a need for significant improving and in verifying an instrument's validity and re reliability. So for this, I would like to briefly go over these terms and discuss their importance to classroom observation. Sorry. So validity is the extent to which an instrument measures what it aims to measure. A valid instrument is one that consists of instructional practices and behaviors that have been tested and proven to lead to student achievement in the setting where it's being used. 
It is most important when collecting data that will be compared across programs or groups to make claims about specific groups of teachers or specific programs, such as an evaluation or a large scale research or even teacher performance evaluations. So for example, if a government wants to assess the quality of the quality of teaching in all of the first grade students in the country, the in instrument must use measures of behaviors that have been tested and proven to lead to student achievement in that context. Determining an instrument's validity requires, sorry, I'm just gonna say this is my first time giving a webinar, so forgive me if I'm not <laughs> able to manage all of the text. Um, instrument is most, um, determining an instrument's validity is, requires rigorous statistical testing conducted by measurement and subject matter experts who compare results with the theories. An instrument that is considered valid in one context does not mean that it is valid in, in another type of setting. So for this, verification of an instrument's validity is, needs to be done and it needs to be documented. So most instruments that are, have been tested for validity and reliability have documentation of this. In the context of EGR programs, using an instrument that is valid would be most critical for observations used for evaluation purposes, and in some cases, research purposes, depending on the research of the research, purpose of the research. For other purposes that you might be using classroom observations, such as uh, supporting individual teacher growth through coaching, um, or and sometimes even monitoring your prog program, validity testing and verification may not be as critical but should still be informed by what we know to date as evidence-based instructional practice and behaviors that have been proven to lead to achievement across multiple contexts. Again, whether the instrument requires validity testing verification depends on the purpose of the observation, what type of information is collected and how the instrument will be used. Reliability is the extent to which an instrument consistently measures what it aims to measure. In other words, the information collected on an instrument during a single observation is consistent across observers. The key words here is consistency. To determine an instrument's reliability requires, also requires rigorous testing, statistical assessments, and piloting. Similar to validity, it's important to keep in mind that even if an instrument is reliable in one context, doesn't mean it is still reliable in another type of setting. So this too must be verified within the setting it will be used. While there are different types of reliability testing that can be done, the toolkit highlights the importance of inter-rater reliability testing on instruments. And what I mean by inter-rater reliability is the, which we also to refer to as IRR, refers to the degree or extent to which a group of observers scores a given item the same. So how consistent is the scoring between two observers when they're observing the same classroom? IRR assessment typically occurs during observer training on the observation instrument. So when you are training your observers on an instrument, ideally you need to be having an assessment of those observers of some sort. Preparing observers to record reliably requires extensive training on the instrument, multiple opportunities for practice, and an observer assessment for IRR. This is often can be done through the use of videos or through shared pairing of going to watch the same observation and then comparing the scores when you come back. Training that results in high IRS assessment scores are more likely to collect data that is reliable. And I believe some of you mentioned the reliability being a challenge, um, or at least the surveys have, have uh, mentioned this. Um, so. The important thing here is around training, making sure that you are assessing your observers for IRR. Results of the survey did suggest that reliable scoring was a challenge. While this can be related to observer capacity, as many programs reported, this can also be done due to a poorly developed instrument. Uh, we often say it's because the observers or the ones who are using the instrument cannot use the instrument because of their capacity. But this can also be our own fault because we've not developed the instrument correctly or we've not provided a adequate training or we did not assess our observers as part of the training. So for this, we need to, to make sure we do a better job of bringing on the right people 
who can help select or develop a high quality instrument that is more likely to get high I IRR results. And you need to pilot that in the setting in which it will be used and properly prepare the observers and assess them for inter-rater reliability. Though it's a required practice for evaluations to document evidence for both reliability and validity, we encourage programs to document results of the validity and reliability testing for other purposes and reports where, where relevant. I'm gonna just stop there for a second because I'm not able to really follow the chat and just want if there's an opportunity to flag something that if there's a key question. Um, otherwise I will keep going. We'll come back to question some key questions later. Ashley, we had a point brought up just um, about the nature of um, assessment, uh, sorry, classroom observation and assessment and sometimes the utility of linking them to help provide some information about the relationships between the two and if you'd like to comment on that classroom observation and this i'm sorry i'm not understanding the question and assessment it's not so much a question but maybe you'd like to expand upon the observation that classroom observation might be also done in connection with student assessment and that we can use the data um, in tandem to help provide insights into oh. instruction and outcomes Yes, so this goes back a little bit to, um, we were talking about purpose and use. Um, a, a lot of programs uh, are increasingly um, starting to compare, use classroom observations as part of their evaluations, and then using the results to compare with uh, results of the early grade reading assessments and being able to link or connect what behaviors have actually linked, um, have influenced the student achievement on, on those different areas of literacy. Is that, is that helpful? Also, I'm not sure if I answered Yeah, I, I think that's just reiterating the point and I believe there's some more in the toolkit and example of a program that has done that. Yeah, okay. Um, if anybody else has a specific question on what Ashley's presented, um, please feel free to share it in the chat. I didn't see any uh, specific to validity and reliability, but um, please don't hesitate to um, share now if you have a question or we can hold it till later. All right. Well, if there's no immediate questions, um, this next slide, Emily's going to share a brief example from practice we highlight in the toolkit. Yeah, so here's another example from practice, and this one is about how IRC has been rigorously testing an instrument for validity and reliability in several different countries for use in their program evaluations. This tool is referred to as the Teacher Classroom Observation, or TCO, and is being used and tested to measure and compare the quality of teaching practices as well as the quality of implement implementation across IRC programs. And as it turns out, you can learn more about IRC's work tomorrow. The Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, the INEE, is hosting a webinar on the soon to be launched Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey, or MENAT, measurement library. And I'm going to paste a link in the chat window. Oh, Allison and I were on it at the same time. So you have the link there <laughs> twice. Um, and um, so check that out. And you may uh, be able to learn more about this topic and more um, tomorrow in that, in that webinar. And okay. so in the next few slides, we'll discuss factors you might consider during instrument development to improve an instrument's potential for IRR. Great, thank you. I'm seeing a comment um, from Lisa Easterbrook on the difficulty of measuring IRR for instruments that are binomial, which are yes, no, uh, binary, versus instruments on a Likert scale. Um, I'm actually about to talk into, um, about item and response formats, um, and hopefully this will address some of those questions. So, Item response, item and response formats are another important factor or two different things, but are important things that you need to consider when uh, selecting or developing an instrument. Um, 
decisions about what item in response formats is most appropriate for your contacts will depend again on the purpose and information needs that you need as your pro for your program and most importantly the expertise and skills of the observer. To briefly define, items are the individual questions or statements on the instrument that are the specific actions, behaviors, or processes being observed. So for example, did, you know, teacher has a lesson plan. Um, these items can be either low inference or high inference, depending on the purpose of the instrument and the level of judgment the observer must make when recording information as well as the purpose. So the items are the, the content uh, that you see on the instrument and what it is that the observer is trying to observe. Just to give you a little, to unpack a little bit what low inference and high inference are, items, what the difference is between the two. Low inference items are statements that are distinct, observable, and do not require an evaluative judgment. For example, if a teacher has a poster with behavioral expectations displayed on the wall, if that's the example in the instrument, this is one specific item that the observer needs to look for. It does not require expertise to be able to identify whether there is a poster on the wall that has behavioral expectations on it. So low, infer low inference items can um, help an instrument to have more reliability because they're very, very distinct, they're very, very specific, and anyone with any level of expertise should be able to identify whether that behavior happened or not. High inference items, on the other hand, are more subjective, and for this requires observers to make uh, an evaluative judgment or, or some level of judgment. For example, in the, in the example I give you, uh, behavioral expectations are clear for students. Well, that, what does it mean to be clear? So you know, that would have to be defined and that observer would need to know how to score, whether it was clear or not. So this item is a bit more difficult to know right off without some understanding of what it means for behavioral expectations to be clear. I've been in, I've been in classrooms for many, many years observing. I have some idea what that might mean, but if I'm creating a reliable instrument, I need to be, a reliable instrument needs to make sure that everyone knows what that, that term clear means and that we're all on the same page. So for this, high, in, high, in, high inference items require an instrument with clear criteria on how to score an item and the observer to have expertise and skills to be able to make that kind of judgment. So of the instruments we reviewed for the survey, um, most included some combination of both low and high inference items. But many instruments did, there were a lot of instruments with high inference items. Um, while high, high inference items can allow for more nuanced and detailed information, this is why we like to use them, that might be more helpful for a program rather than just knowing did the behavior occur or not. The, the instrument might not collect the most reliable data if the instrument does not have clear scoring criteria for each item and the observers have not been properly trained to use the instrument and there's not been a proper IRR assessment. So in terms of guidance for, for item and response formats, um, developing a high quality instrument with high inference items requires more expertise, time, and resources of both those who are developing the instrument as well as those who are using the instrument and thus require more time and, time and resource. For these reasons, the guidance provided in the toolkit, we, we suggest a lot more low inference items for most of the purposes, particularly when observer capacity and time and resources are limited. However, the type of items selected really depends on the program, the context, and um, most importantly, I think, the, the observer capacity. Depending on whether you use low inference items or high inference items can also influence what type of response format you use. Response formats are the way in which information for each question or item is recorded or documented. So to go back to my example, the teacher have a lesson plan. Um, how, do, how, are, how are they going to respond? Is it going to be a yes, no? Uh, is it going to be a, a scale of some sort? So response formats also depend on what the instrument aims to measure. So examples of some common Formats include the checklist, rating skills, and time interval sampling formats. I'm just going to take a second to go through 
Checklists provide the observer a choice of two responses, such as yes, no. Um, in this format, the, the observer simply checks whether a specific teacher behavior is observed or not. Did the teacher have a lesson plan? Yes or no? Was there a chart on, displayed on the wall for, with behavioral expectations? Yes or no? For this, low inference items to stress again are distinct observable behaviors. Some instruments do choose checklists with yes, partially, and no. Uh, this can help collect more nuanced information because maybe uh, it's kind of, maybe they had some sort of chart and it was halfway and it had behavioral expectations written on it, but it didn't have anything listed on it. Um, the, the effort was there, but maybe it was not quality. So some choose to have uh, a more nuanced checklist um, and this can be okay, but it can also be problematic in some cases if the items are not clearly defined um, and that our observers are not trained on understanding the differences between those. Um, so we do provide templates. I'm going to talk about these a little bit more, but just to reference, there are, there are several annexes um, that in the back of the toolkit that have instruments with low inference items and binary response formats, checklist. Um, we also, another example is, um, here's the example, sorry. Uh, rating scales are formats that use a range of numerical numbers for scoring responses or text responses. So what I mean by numerical, they either have one equals never, two equals sometimes, or three equals always, something to that effect, or a, a descriptive text response, which might be never, rarely, sometimes, frequently, and always. The rating scale format allows the observer to be able to rate the frequency sometimes or the quality of specific items observed in the classroom. This requires the observer to make a judgment using spe specified criteria on a, writing, on a rating scale. So here's an example of a rating scale. Another type of response format is the time interval sampling. This format allows for observer to record specific behaviors or processes and the frequency of those behaviors in a specified time interval. This format can help the observer capture an estimated teacher's use of instructional time or amount of time students are engaged. Low inference items are typically used with a time interval sampling response. Uh, here's an example. Um, this is an, um, an example that similar to some that have been used in evaluation in evaluations to measure the changes in use of instructional time. We also provide an annex um, of an illustrative example at the end of the toolkit. In our review of the different response formats of instruments, instruments vary depending on the purpose. Yes, no checklists were the most common and were used for a variety of purposes. Um, time interval sampling, which is a little bit more complicated, was more common in evaluations. Some used a combination of several different formats. Um, we, when we're looking at the item and response formats together, we found several inconsistency and mismatches. Um, for example, in a yes, no checklist, some people had high inference items. So it was asking the observer to check yes, if something was of quality or no. And so a yes, no checklist is not really great for uh, evaluative kind of statements because it's, it's not always black and white. Um, some use rating scales, um, but without clear scoring criteria. So it was very uncertain how to score those rating skills and that creates issues for re reliability. Such instruments are less likely to collect data that is going to be reliable and consistent across observers. So we encourage programs to think about carefully about what item and response format is most appropriate for the purpose, information needed and the observer capacity. We strongly recommend piloting different items and re response formats in order to identify what is most appropriate for your context. And that will allow the project to develop an instrument that will collect the most reliable and valid da data. I'm gonna stop right there. I know this is very um, heavy, but these are the key terms that it really requires you to understand what these terms mean in order to understand the guidance that we provide at the end. So it was very important for us to take the time in this first section to, to go through these. And I still am not finished, so, but I do want to take a moment to just uh, see if there's anyone who has an important comment. Alan, and I'm seeing one. 
Yeah, hi, Ashley. I just put in the chat to you uh, something from earlier, which may have okay. uh, you know, gone by. Um, if you could maybe address this issue as to whether you, know, you can get at issues of pedagogy um, with low and, and versus high inference questions, and maybe does that look different? Um, and is it possible to really understand what's happening in terms of pedagogy through low inference questions? Um, let me just read this question because I think it's a very important question. One way of sometimes, I'm reading the question, one way I have sometimes described it is that low inference can be useful when the focus is on didactics and high inference are most necessary when the focus is on pedagogy. Um, I wasn't sure if you would necessarily agree with this <clears throat> since it seems you can get at pedagogy. Um, yeah, uh, Allison, do you, <laughs> I'm still trying to kind of capture the the question. Um, I mean, I think low inference, like you said, ideally, um, you would want to have expert, you know, observers that have expertise in being in the classroom, understanding pedagogy, and being able to identify uh, what's good and what's bad, and then you can change them or what needs improvement, and then you can train them on the instrument. We're not always in situations where we have that level of expertise across observers. So in that situation, yes, we do need, you, you do need to be using low inference um, statements, but with that, you are going to miss out on some very nuanced information that might be more helpful in understanding um, some of the behaviors and, and the quality of behaviors that are happening. I'm not sure if that's um, answered. Allison, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think you gave some good examples of how you can, you can understand what's happening uh, in terms of instruction through low inference questions and it's often in the um, construction of the item that is what's particularly important to make sure is very clear and not necessarily always that it's an issue of the particular um, response format. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on. We're going to have another uh, time at the end of this to, to, at the end of this section to come back to some questions. And I'm sorry, but there's so many questions right now that it's hard to scroll and present at the same time. So we'll it's have okay. a moment. We're flagging them for you. Some of them are, don't worry. <laughs> okay, great. Um, people asking for links and um, other things. So we'll try to okay. flag those for you here. Okay. Um, so um, moving on to the next slide. So another feature that you have to consider is um, the overall focus of an observation instrument. I'm not gonna go into detail of here, but the main point here is the, the focus is basically what it is that the instrument wants to measure or capture. So programs might be interested in understanding if teachers are applying evidence-based reading instructional strategies only. They just wanna know if they exist. Are they there? Are they using them? And is this different than what was happening at the beginning of an initiative? Or maybe they might be interested in understanding the quality in which teachers are applying the strategies. These are two very different focuses or measurements of, of for an instrument. Um, it will be dependent on the purpose of the observation and what it aims to measure and will also inform what kind of item and response format you will need. So the most common in, EG, in early grade reading programs that we found was most people were looking at the presence of behaviors like uh, specifically uh, reading uh, instructional evidence-based reading instructional strategies the frequency of how often those behaviors might be happening um, and then as I mentioned earlier in some of the evaluations um, programs were interested in looking at the use of instructional time or uh, estimated use of instructional time or how teachers were allocating their time to specific strategies or content um, Few people were measuring, there was one evaluation that looked specifically at time on task using uh, the Stallings and a validated and uh, reliable instrument that's been tested and improved in other contexts uh, for measuring time on task specifically. Few measure quality. Um, this this is, has likely, because it is difficult to measure quality, and it's, it's different to define quality and um, Okay, so another consideration um, 
is the instructional category, categories or competency. So this is the main content. We've talked about the item and response formats. We've talked about uh, instrument re reliability and validity, but these are what, what categories and behaviors do you actually put on the instrument? Um, and I'm sorry, but I'm not going to have the right answer for every instrument. But um, the important thing to take out of this is that the instruments are organized into, ev should be organized into evidence-based categories or competencies that have been proven to lead to a student achievement. We can't just pick our own, but ones that um, have, have actually been proved, tested and proven to lead to student achievement. Examples of evidence-based categories um, that have been proven as predictors to student learning across different contexts are and are included in well-known observation instruments included the following or some variation of these. Lex lesson structure, content, and facilitation. So how, how is, does the teacher have a lesson plan? How is the teacher, is the teacher following a particular sequence that the lesson plan or the scripted lesson plan um, suggests? Uh, classroom management, physical classroom environment, classroom culture, student participation engagement, checking for understanding, and feedback. These are all categories that have been proven to lead to student achievement in many contexts, but not all. Um, and not necessarily all within the context of a lot of early grade reading programs that we're working in are focused. Um, the important thing to consider is is that classroom observation instruments should consist of categories that have been proven for the setting you're working if possible and that each instructional category consists of behaviors that can serve as indicators of success. So I just want to highlight quickly, you have categories and then within those categories, for example, classroom management, you have specific behaviors that may be relevant to your context that would actually demonstrate that the teachers had some proficiency in managing their classroom. Well, for example, you might have on feedback, what are the specific teacher behaviors or student behaviors that you'd wanna see that would give you some indication that that teacher um, is using feedback in her classroom regularly. Okay, um, finally, the final consideration. Um, instrument feasibility and usability are also important factors to consider. Um, Feasibility refers to the potential of a classroom observation instrument to be used appropriately and effectively given the purpose, the scope of the instrument, the context, observer capacity, and the time and period in which the observation will be conducted. So for example, an instrument with many high inference items might be feasible in a context with observers with a certain level of knowledge and skills, but it might not be feasible in another or an instrument appropriate in one context might be too difficult, too costly, too lengthy when used in a different context with a different budget, different observers, or a different amount of time. Usability refers to the degree of user friendliness of the instrument as well as the processes for data management. <laughs> Sometimes we don't think about the kind of tool and what, what it means to actually, what are we gonna do with the, the information and how are we going to um, manage all of that information. So a user-friendly instrument that is paper-based requires a format, a structure and font that are easy to understand and use and an easy to code format for data entry. So for example, an instrument that has small font and large amounts of text may be challenge, challenging for an observer to read. Um, instruments with inconsistent formats throughout the document, which require observers to shift from a yes-no to uh, a highly complicated rating scale, these might be difficult. So you want to make sure that um, and this will also affect your, your reliability. So you, you do want to make sure that um, you are considering whether how the user-friendliness, user -friendly, user sorry. Um, Binary checklists are the easiest to code format um, and the easiest data managed process. With that said, it's not suggesting that we highly recommend it because as I've mentioned that um, there, you know, it doesn't collect, it doesn't gather the, the more nuanced information. It does, however, ensure a more reliable instrument when you have uh, capacity, when the observer capacity is low. So just quickly, um, many instruments were too long 
when we looked at the surveys, some were 14 pages. Um, these can be very difficult for observers to manage uh, in a 45 minute class to observe on specific things. It's requiring observers to flip between pages um, or in the case of electronic instruments to navigate between screens. Um, which distracts their attention away from the teachers and learners, which is the point of what they're supposed to be observing. Some instruments written in English use jargon or terminology very specific to American English uh, that might be difficult for a second language English speaker to understand. For example, an item on one instrument read, the teacher provides rich and meaningful lessons in language development. When the U in American English, that's a very common, we use rich to, to you know, describe that it's, you know, it's a, it's a quality lesson. Um, but in the other context, rich might mean something else. Some instruments had inconsistent and complicated item and response formats requiring the observer to learn how to score using several different formats. Some instruments used highly subjective evaluative items without including clear scoring criteria to guide the observer, requiring the observers to have more techn technical knowledge in order to score consistently. Now for many of these instruments, we couldn't actually know who the observers were, but some, for example, were using um, uh, coaches that didn't, you know, that had only been trained on early grade reading instructional practices during the initial training, and they were uh, responsible for evaluating teachers using rating scales, um, and this was not something that they were necessarily prepared to do. So when selecting or developing an instrument, always keep in mind the skills and capacity of the observers at the forefront of your mind all the time, as well as the cost and time required to administer the instrument. An instrument that is too lengthy may not be feasible to implement within the period of single lesson observation. An instrument with evaluative rating criteria may be too difficult uh, for observers with limited experience in pedagogy and may require additional training time and cost. So keep it simple, keep it consistent, consider the format, the font, the language, and the sentence structure of the instrument. Format should be very clear with font and spacing that's easy to read. Try to avoid having too much text on one page. Be consistent with the item and response formats we discussed as much as possible to make it easier for the observer to score. Switching from a binary response in one section to a rating scale in another section and then a different type of rating scale in another makes it very complicated for the observer to just learn how to use the instrument. Um, we don't want them to be trying to figure out the instrument while they are observing. Um, also, finally, consider the language of the instrument and the native language of the observers. It's always helpful to, you know, have someone that is bilingual in both languages that you're using to check against some of those terms that may not be very common. Just to think about the key terms and content we just covered. I just covered a lot of important information and I'm sorry for, for providing so much dense information, but it really is important in order to understand some of the guidance that we're going to discuss as we wrap up. So think about in your chat box, take, take a moment to think about something that you learned about classroom observation in this section and what is something you have a question about or did not understand concerning this content. I don't think we've had specific questions, just a okay. few comments here that we're all <clears throat> uh, just kind of adding some additional thoughts about user friendliness being very critical to helping observer feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Also important to create a teacher friendly observation experience um, that focuses on learning and is, is professional. We'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes. Um, there was a question around calculating IRR. If, um, you might, I think it's just coming back here again. If you'd like to talk about, you know, what do people need to think about in, in figuring out how to calculate that and mm. why they're not necessarily going to find a formula in our toolkit. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we do provide a bit of high level. I, I, we do not go in a lot of detail of how to calculate IRR because it's a very, um, it's a very specific, um, assessment that needs to be done and, and different people do it different ways and we just did not get into that level of guidance. Um, usually you would in order to develop um, uh, 
to do an IR assessment, you, we encourage you to draw from the experts uh, within your organization um, that are, have expertise in measurement um, and have uh, experience because they would be the ones that would have um, a lot of experience and knowledge of how to, with the instrument that you're using how would, and the context in which you're using, how to test for IRR. So we encourage and, and refer you to, to, to meet with the your measurement um, personnel in your, in your organization or government institution or wherever you might be. Someone mentioned uh, on calculating IR on yes, no items. That's a question I have because I have never really actually conducted one on yes, no items. Has, has, um, I'd be interested to hear if anyone in the panel or audience has. Um, yes, I know, I know I have and I know there's others as well and I think people do different things in terms of strategies for doing that, whether they're doing it um, using video or matched pairs, but then the specific calculations, again, the whole field of IRR is one that is, it could probably be its own webinar for sure. So I think it's just useful that people are talking with the right experts on their team to figure out what would be appropriate. And, you know, certainly this is something that the community of practice could take a deeper dive in at some point. Um, that was certainly the case with early grade reading assessments and lots of different ways for conducting IRR and um, eventually coming to a place where there's a little more consensus, but still variation. So I think it's just important to realize that um, the right experts need to be a part of that discussion and it's something to plan in advance, not to try to figure out you know, at the workshop. Yeah, I just wanna clarify, cause um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, I'm not sure IRR. I was specifically talking about with yes, no items, because if you have a really good yes, no item with low inference statements, and when I may, just to repeat, a low inference item being something that's very distinct and observable, um, it's going to, if you have good items, then you, the, the need for checking for IRR assessment in a, in a instrument, for example, for coaching or for an informal, you would, you would not necessarily um, need. In Uganda, we have classes with 160 pupils. Do you have advice in terms of observation? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm reading. Uh, Allison, I'm trying to follow a little bit too many questions. Um, so, I, I, the issue of class, large class sizes is one we know we've all encountered in various contexts where we're working and you know part of the observation might be to try to understand what practices teachers are using in those environments so again it's kind of to the the context and purpose matter what are you trying to find out in those contexts um certainly some items might be tailored differently so um again thinking through the purpose and what you want to know um is useful and then piloting the assessment instrument, um, which Ashley's mentioned and I think is perhaps maybe a good segue into the next section just in the, the interest of time. I know there's other comments and I appreciate a lot of you out there who are experts in IRR have been giving some shout outs to the different statistical approach. Again, I think it's important to know that we, we didn't necessarily dive into every issue um, in depth, but gave a lot of the guidance on the things to consider and who you need on your team to really come up with a valid, reliable classroom observation instrument and, and exercise. So Ashley, I think I'm going to ask you if you could just advance the slides now to get to our last section, which does focus on that guidance. Okay. And if you can move to the next slide. So as Ashley said earlier, or Emily, the toolkit is structured into providing an overview in all of these key issues. And then thinking about all of those issues, formulating some guidance um, around classroom observation tool development and really about the whole process. Because while we certainly want to focus on the tool, it is a 
a process of figuring out what you want to do and how are you using the data and as um, one of the Elisa said um, thinking through your protocols for your classroom visits. So the first important thing, as I just mentioned, is identifying the purpose of the observation. Um, that's going to guide and inform so many of the decisions about all aspects of instrument development and use, as, as Ashley's talked about, the format of your questions or your items and your responses. What um, is the focus of your instrument? What categories and behaviors? Um, and Ashley, you can just advance to that first uh, bullet point there. Um, on table two of page 18, we list all of those observations and some various considerations related to them. And, you know, people I know have, have often said they go to develop a classroom observation tool on one topic and then they get all the people in the room and all of a sudden it's, it is that 14 page instrument Ashley mentioned and all the different parts of a project or, or different uh, departments within a Ministry of Education want to use that opportunity to find out all sorts of information. And so that's where making sure you're clear on the, the purpose and the parameters of what you're doing is really important to keep the instrument focused on what you need to find out. Uh, the second important consideration is engaging stakeholders and technical experts. We hear this all the time across all components of really great reading programs. Who needs to be in the room? Who needs to be at the table? So we've talked about a lot of issues today um, where you do need people with those different hats of experience, whether it's a reading specialist, whether it's somebody who knows about statistical analyses, measurement specialists, your program staff who have been involved in the design and implementation of teacher professional development so they understand what it is that you need to be looking at if your purpose is for evaluation or your purpose is for coaching. Um, those are also the people who would understand the realities on the ground. So they would know that the observation needs to consider very large class sizes. What does that mean perhaps for content, but also for the whole protocol of the visit? And on page uh, 32, uh, um, table five, we've listed out all of those people. So if you uh, have a uh, classroom observation workshop coming up, go through that and you know, verify that you have those people and perhaps in your context there are others who should also be at that in, in part of that planning process and implementation process. Um, the next key uh, point of guidance about developing or adapting a high quality instrument is you know, really what Ashley has been focusing on. Um, it's the first step, selecting an existing instrument or developing something new. We, Ashley's gonna be talking a bit about the, temp, the templates, um, which were developed by looking through all the existing interest in, instruments that we had and trying to pull out the best features of those variety of instruments. Um, thinking through those important considerations that Ashley mentioned about um, item and response format, usability, feasibility, and then um, pilot, um, pilot testing that instrument. If you go to the next two points, Ashley, you can bring up at the same time, somebody mentioned along with developing the instrument, talking about um, protocols for the classroom observation visit. Um, certainly if uh, observer doesn't do the whole visit right, the, the data that you're gathering might not be um, what you expect it to be. And so piloting both the instrument and the whole protocol for the observation visit is really essential. Um, thinking through the instrument development process is, a, is really iterative that you can even begin field testing um, certain items and then going back and workshopping some more to figure out if those items are appropriate for the context and the observer capacity, training a small cohort of observers to do the pilot so that you're also in addition to verifying the content and validity and reliability, you're also assessing those, the feasibility and usability of the instrument for the observers. Um, and I think just to underscore, it's really important to be you know, open to change and that sometimes we, we spend a lot of time thinking we have developed the perfect instrument, but then we get into the schools and we see the data and it might not be the case. And, we heard so much of that in the survey. I think it was a really humbling set of results of a lot of people saying, um, you know, we developed this instrument, but we had a few misses. These items weren't quite capturing what we wanted them to. Our instrument was too long. It was and sometimes too difficult. And there were certainly positive experiences as well. So leaving sufficient time to pilot, but then also to really carefully review the data from it 
and to go back and make adjustments that are needed. Um, so on the next slide is a couple more of these considerations, um, underscoring really that importance of training and support to classroom observers. We've mentioned that in a lot of the contexts where classroom observations being used to support early grade reading improvement, the capacity of observer, observers might be lower than it might be um, uh, desired and that we, you know, that's the reality and that we have to plan for training. So both allowing time for planning for the training that it's really important to have good facilitators, good training materials, um, having videos that can be used, that can be developed for the context that show teachers in an environment um, teaching so they can be used during the training for observers to practice. Um, aligning the instrument, um, the training to the instrument, excuse me, um, also is really key, providing so many opportunities for observers to practice. So it's a very hands-on training and then that we're assessing inter-rater reliability multiple times to see if there's improvement, to see where additional support is needed. Um, and that gets to another point about ongoing training and support. Some survey respondents noted that training is not just one and done, that if you are using classroom observation for monitoring, or you're doing it again at an endline assessment for evaluation, or even coaches, um, they all need ongoing training and support. So to plan for multiple opportunities for um, training of, of observers. And you can see some more guidance on page 35. Um, the next uh, guidance point on planning for instrument administration. Um, we didn't talk about this a lot, but there's some more discussion in the toolkit on identifying what's the appropriate medium for your instrument. Is it paper? Is it an e-version? Is it some combination? how to think through some decision-making on that. And there's certainly been different experiences and we highlight some of those in the guidance tool. And um, thinking through again about the frequency, how often do you need to do it? Um, somebody earlier in the webinar mentioned, you know, do you notify teachers in advance? And what, when would you do that? And when might you not want to do that? So there's a lot of planning and so many of you indicated already you've done this and you can certainly share some of your other um, recommendations around this, this issue, but there is um, certainly more to read about on page 35 where we talk about things to put on your work plan as you plan for going to the field to do observation. Um, and last but not least is the whole issue of disseminating and using the results. Obviously a lot of time, effort, and, and money is going into developing observation instruments and conducting observations that we want to make sure we use the data and we didn't have the access or necessarily time to look at all the results from the instruments we saw. And, but there was a sense from respondents that we're not necessarily using all the data we're gathering. We're putting so much effort into that end of it, but how are we using it and planning in advance for that and who is going to communicate that information and to whom and how are they doing it? So just to underscore, that is an, it's the end, but needs planning at the very beginning. Um, I'm going to just go to the next slide, which also lists some other resources relevant to classroom observation. And you can jot these down, or we'll also send you a link to this presentation um, after the event that are, were produced by the Global Reading Network, also the ECCN network that relate to classroom observation. So thinking about it in the context of coaching, uh, the forthcoming literacy landscape assessment toolkit, which many of you may have heard about at various events, which thinks about how do we understand our context and you know observation is a part of that. Um, and, and a couple of other ones. So if you're looking to take a, a deeper dive into one issue, somebody did mention some issues around you know, how can classroom observation be used to understand issues related to gender equity or conflict and crisis context. And we certainly mentioned those in the toolkit that that's part of, you know, your purpose and what the focus of your instrument should be. And we have some guidance and also point you to some resources in the toolkit. So as, Great. Um, we have about five minutes left, so we'll just... Um, okay sharing with you some information about the, the templates and 
and then we'll we'll close. Okay. Okay, so in the Annex, we offer five instrument templates, each representing a different observation purpose. Um, the categories and behaviors that we use are informed by other instruments being used in EGR and early grade reading programs that represent what we know to date as best practices as we know them. But I just want to be clear, these instruments have not been tested and validated. These are meant to serve as examples of item and response formats that we've gone through and examples of low inference and, and high inference statements. So these will be very useful for you as a guide, but want to emphasize these are starting points for further context and program specific adaptation. Um, we, they're not to be used off the shelf. Each template includes examples only and um, you must need you need to consider the observer capacity and instrument validity and reliability depending on your purpose for um, instrument focus and uh, we do provide prefaces for suggestions for use as well as for adaptation um, these are very useful to look at because we didn't talk a whole lot about the differences between uh, each of these but for example, the coaching instrument is very different than how you might use for an instrument for other purposes. So just to quickly show you um, some screenshots, we do we provide one on teacher needs assessment, um, which is an example of a yes no checklist with low inference items. We provide a coaching tool, which is a little bit different, but has a yes no checklist with space for evidence. Um, and it has a lot more sections there that might be important for you to look at if you're interested in looking at observation instruments for coaching. Um, monitoring fidelity of implementation, um, we provide an example of a paper-based tool that um, what that might look like. We also provide an example of a, a tool, an instrument measuring instructional time, which is often used in evaluations. And then finally, we provide just a very, very simple observation checklist with low inference statements that can be used for anybody, uh, USAID government or other stakeholders that don't necessarily know much about your program or just need to come in and, and see what's going on and see what, what teacher behaviors are present or not. Um, just in final, if I have a second to include just uh, results from this review suggested there's critical need for early grade classroom observation instrument development and use. Uh, it's clear we need to be more thoughtful and intentional about the kind of information we want to capture and the kind of instrument program should select. Developing a quality instrument is complex, it's time consuming and requires extensive planning and collaboration well in advance before starting the instrument development process. This toolkit provides overarching and initial guidance only. As ben, Emily mentioned, the toolkit's not meant to be a step-to-step -step guide, so we've not been able to address every single question on how to develop a quality observation instrument. We provide guidance on what you might consider, but we do encourage you to consult with specialists when you're designing and, co and conducting um, classroom observation instruments. So moving forward, further discussion is needed. Uh, we need to discuss as a community of practice how to, how to improve planning, development of in instruments, and the use of information. Improving the quality insurance of instruments. How do we ensure that all of our instruments are of quality, the ones that we're using? And expanding the focus from adherence, uh, teacher behaviors, how, whether they are adhering to a program, to looking more at issues of quality and how can we do that. Increase experience sharing and reflection. Opportunities like this are a wonderful way for us all to come together. I think there's over 100 people here to increase our experience sharing and reflection to generate um, best practices. Um, I did have a few things to work on to go back to what you've learned, but I'm going to stop there. Um, and Allison, do you want me to continue? Should do we have time to continue with the last? Yeah, why don't we just do the very last activity? Okay. So I was just going to ask not, you to. Not this one, but the, the next one that you have, the last one. Okay. Thinking about what you've learned today, what we've um, discussed in a very short amount of time, um, just, I wanted to ask you to just think a little bit about what you're doing right now. Um, and what you have learned from this experience, what you might be able to do or want to improve on in terms of the development and use of classroom observation um, in an early grade reading initiative or whatever initiative you might be working on where it's relevant.
So please take a moment and reflect on the question provided here. And if we can use the Zoom chat, it's another opportunity for us to engage a little bit more with discussion. While we're waiting, I'm seeing Rita Bean's comment, um, which I appreciated earlier when I saw it. Um, just to add that the her question was about coaching and whether it should be a more focused observation or not. And um, in my experience, I've seen where um, some programs have actually focused if they're if they're a program that's focused around competencies, for example, coaches are focused specifically on looking at one or two competencies in a lesson. So they have very different, some programs have very different instruments um, that look specifically, they may have one instrument that focuses on one specific competency and that coach may work with a teacher for, you know, several weeks or on, on that specific competency or whatever competency that they need uh, improvement in. But our, our toolkit doesn't go into that kind of detail um, around coaching guidance, unfortunately. Um, well, thank you. I see a few more people sharing. We're happy that you know, this has led to some ideas on what you could start doing today or tomorrow even, perhaps in your own, own, in your own projects. And we hope that once you read through the toolkit, you'll get some more ideas on how to improve the, the process and outcomes of classroom observation. So Ashley, if you just wanna to go to the next slide. Um, the toolkit has just been posted to the Global Reading Network's website. You'll get a link directly to that in your inbox soon after the webinars. And um, as I mentioned, since the REACH initiative is coming to an end at the end of November, though all of our resources are going to be transferred over to USAID's Education Links website. So um, some actually are already there, but they will find their way there in the next few weeks. Um, thank you everyone again for joining us for our very last REACH webinar. And certainly though, we hope to con continue the conversation um, and in other ways. So thank you again, Ashley yes. and Emily. Yes, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.